A lot of people in America don't know what a helter skelter is. Uh, they think it's a roller coaster, but it's a sort of conical thing with a slide around the outside of it. You walk up in the stairs inside, and then you'd slide down, and then you'd walk up again. And it was fun, you know. So I just used that as a sort of um, symbol of um, life. I go up to the top, I stop, and I turn, and I come down to the bottom, so I see you again. So I, I was really thinking of moods. You're up. You get knocked down, you, you're feeling euphoric, and you're feeling miserable. Such is the nature of life. And, and, and I came to Hollywood, and so I didn't get my sort of party to introduce me to everyone. So I stayed in the Beverly Hills Hotel in a, in a great big luxury suite, all on my own. And no one ever talked to me or anything. And no one called me, nothing happened. So I used to go down into the lobby and see if I could see any film stars. And I sat in the lobby, and John Wayne came in. And I thought, oh, John Wayne, he only had the hat. And he got off a helicopter straight out of the desert. He was covered in dust and everything. He was checking in at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And he looked over, he saw me. He said, what's your name, kid? I said, Michael Caine. He said, you're in that movie called Alfie? I said, yeah. He said, you're going to be a big star, kid. I said, thank you, Mr. Wayne. And he said, let me give you some advice. He said, talk low, talk slow, and don't say too much. And never wear suede shoes. I said, what? Why never wear suede shoes? He says, because as I said, he said, you're, you're going to be very famous. And you'll be going in the toilet and taking a pee. There'll be a guy next to you. And he's going to say, Michael Caine. And he's going to pee all over your shoes. The most boring marathon in history was 1909, indoors at the Royal Albert Hall. Two runners only, Durando Pietro and C.W. Gardner, raced in front of 2,000 spectators and took 524 laps of the Albert Hall. A military band provided music to make the time pass more pleasantly for the spectators. Please subscribe for more curious tales and tours. Where is the final home of the Ark of the Covenant? The biblical Ark of the Covenant, described in several books of the Old Testament, was not a sea-going vessel like Noah's Ark, but it did hold treasures. The four-foot-long gilded box not only contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments, but it also wielded fearsome power. Carried before the Israelites, it split the waters of the River Jordan, paraded around Jericho, it also helped to bring down the city's walls. Finally, the Ark was placed for safekeeping in Jerusalem's first temple, built by Solomon. And there the trail ends. When the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem in 586 BC, the temple was destroyed and the Ark vanishes from the records. Some believe it's still buried in the Temple Mount. A few European authors believe the Ark was captured during the Crusades and taken to France. And the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has said it actually has the Ark in Axum, Ethiopia, but has not shown it to the public. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. Arthur Conan Doyle was a doctor. There are medicines and scientific references throughout his work. And of course, Agatha worked with poisons and potions. And so many of her short stories and novels, the murderers, have used either a poison or a potion of some kind. Both of them lived miles away, but they made a lot of childhood trips to London. They both failed at their chosen or the chosen for them professions. With Arthur Conan Doyle, it was medicine. It wasn't so much that he failed. He didn't feel it was going as well as he wanted. And what he really wanted to be was a writer. Agatha Christie did actually want to be a classical musician, a singer, but she felt that she failed at that and fell into writing. Both of them started to try to to get published originally to help their family out of debt. It's interesting that in the modern day, when people want to be actors or singers or musicians or writers, they feel that that isn't for them a profession that will make them money and they have to find a regular job to pay the bills while they follow that passion. But strangely, in both Doyle and Christie's lives, finding the creative profession was something that they felt could help their family out of debt. It's interesting the juxtaposition of that. Two famous characters, both based on real people. Joseph Bell was the inspiration, the doctor for Sherlock Holmes, and a Belgian man that Agatha Christie saw in Torquay seemed to be the inspiration for Hercule Poirot. The differences in social classes in both writers' works, the idea of travel, Agatha Christie was shy and Arthur Conan Doyle most definitely wasn't. She always remained shy. The detection club asked her to be the president 
and who better to ask, really? She agreed on the condition that she didn't ever have to make a speech. Even quite shy around her family, she was always said that she would hide away and write. She would let the ideas fester. She would lock herself away. Her son-in-law, Anthony Hicks, said he never once saw her write. She would just appear one day with a completed work. She insisted that her photograph never appeared in the corners or the covers of books. She rarely gave interviews. She hated violence. You hardly ever see the murder or the murderer. It's almost always a discovered body, mostly poisoned. She had six notebooks where she kept ideas and she would also cut out stories from newspapers about poisonings or money swindling. In the centre of the West End, at the junction between Charing Cross Road and Shaftesbury Avenue, lies the location of an iconic film, 84 Charing Cross Road, originally the site of Marks & Co., a shop founded in the 1920s by Benjamin Marks and Mark Cohen. A book of correspondence between Helen Hanf and Frank Dole, together with other members of staff between 1949 and 1968, was published by Helen Hanf as a book of memoirs, 84 Charing Cross Road. It was later made into a stage play, a television play, and a BAFTA award-winning film with Anne Bancroft and Anthony Hopkins. It describes a friendship between two people through letters alone. And here was the location, now a fast food chain, but the plaque is still here. Join me at Curious Tales and Tours for more. Please subscribe below. Another movie mystery which will never be solved. In Blade Runner, is the detective Rick Deckard a replicant? The open-ended nature of the film itself leaves it open for debate. There's a lot of evidence to support Ridley Scott's stance that Deckard is a synthetic life form. Not least of all, his recurring dream about a unicorn, which is heavily implied to be a neural implant. But equally, there's some very valid dissenting arguments, with none other than Deckard's portrayer, Harrison Ford, maintaining that he was indeed playing a human character. It's a question that matters far more than the answer, and that's probably why Denis Villeneuve's follow-up, Blade Runner 2049, avoids explicitly addressing the issue. It all boils down to whether you side with Ridley Scott or Harrison Ford. Although on a side note, Philip K. Dick's original story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Rick Deckard was categorically human. Is there a curse on the Bermuda Triangle? The writer Vincent Gaddis was the first to suggest that the region of ocean bounded by Miami, Bermuda and Puerto Rico, an area he dubbed the Bermuda Triangle, was cursed. Writing in 1964, he told the story of the five bombers of the ill-fated Navy Flight 19. After taking off from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, on a routine training mission in 1945, the planes reported compass problems and eventually fell silent, never returning to base. Tragically, 14 men were lost. Fans of the paranormal began to collect other tales of ships and planes lost, portraying it as a region where compasses fail and an unusual number of people simply vanish. Alien abductions, space vortices, and energies from Atlantis were all put forward to explain the disappearances. Pilot Bruce Gernon, flying from the Bahamas to Palm Beach, Florida in 1970, told of entering a strange tunnel of clouds that seemed to take him through another dimension and deliver him to Florida in half the normal time. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. In both P.D. James's novel, Children of Men, and Alfonso Cuaron's screen adaptation, humanity confronts its own extinction after 20 years of worldwide infertility. And then a glimmer of hope arrives in the form of pregnant refugee Key. But annoyingly, we're never told exactly how humanity found itself in such a dire predicament in the first place. Of course, hints are scattered throughout the film. Everything that ranges from divine judgment to environmental upheaval, they're all presented as possible causes. Alfonso himself, who was very vocal on his hatred of exposition-heavy storytelling, intentionally keeps the audience in the dark, both in the movie itself and in interviews to this very day. As I said, the original book by P.D. James provides no clarity. This is going to be a tough one. Although on a side note, P.D. James said that they wrote the book as a Christian parable. Join me at Curious Tales and Tours for more. Where was the Garden of Eden? According to the book of Genesis, a river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and onyx stone are there. 
The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now this would suggest locations perhaps in Syria, Turkey, Iraq, or Iran. However, the book of Ezekiel also refers to Eden on a holy mountain, possibly in what is now Lebanon. If the holy mountain is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and the original river is the Jordan, Eden could have been in what is now Israel. If the Gihon River is the Nile, as some believe, North Africa might have contained Eden. But some believe it is located in Jackson County, Missouri, and to some, even the planet Mars. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. When was the world's first colour film? Well, there's a lot of disagreement about this. It certainly wasn't the Technicolor Adventures of Robin Hood, as many believe. A full two decades before, a colour film named Cupid Angling was released. It was filmed in Douglas Natural Colour, a process devised by film producer Leon Douglas. Unfortunately, no prints of Cupid Angling are known to survive. It's now considered a lost film, but it's possible it was the first colour film ever released. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. What lives in the deepest seas? In 2010, a census of marine life brought the total number of described non-bacterial marine species to 250,000, but they also estimated that some 750,000 remain to be discovered. Most mysterious are the waters about 3,000 feet below the surface, where sunlight disappears. Darkness means photosynthesis will not operate. The only light to be found is from bioluminescence. Many of the deep sea creatures live on detritus floating down from higher waters. Temperatures sit around freezing. Pressure at the bottom can reach an obliterating 1000 atm. 1 atm is roughly the pressure at sea level, and live specimens hauled to the surface can die on the way up, unable to tolerate the lower pressures. They have found some surprising giants in these dark waters. Tube worms and bacteria first found around deep sea vents in 1977 represent archaic forms of life, but they're relatively new to science. About 500 new species were discovered during the recent census. Each new venture into deep waters finds more. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. The Mystery of the Easter Island Statues Easter Island, Rapa Nui to the indigenous community, is a very remote Pacific island. The closest land, Pitcairn, is over a thousand miles away. More than a thousand years ago, hundreds of monoliths were raised up, and they have fascinated archaeologists ever since. Somehow, these giant statues were transported to their current positions on stone platforms. What was their purpose, and how did people move them? Local legend says the statues actually walked, and recently archaeologists have shown they might have been right, in that a few dozen people using ropes, rocking a moai from side to side on its curved base, can actually walk it forward. They may have been symbols of power between warring groups. They may have had a peaceful religious purpose, but at the moment, we're not sure. Join me at Curious Tales and Tours for more, and enjoy a wonderful Easter Sunday. How will the universe end? In the movie Annie Hall, young Alvy Singer has stopped doing his homework because the universe is expanding. Someday it will break apart and that would be the end of everything. So what's the point? Alvy's not wrong. It is expanding and will someday come to an end as we know it. The nature of that end, however, is still an open question. Depending on the amount of matter and energy in the universe, one of three models will probably apply. The Big Crunch, the Big Chill, or the Big Rip. In the Big Crunch, there's enough mass in the universe to slow and then reverse expansion, so the universe collapses back in upon itself. In the Big Chill, there's not enough mass to stop expansion, and galaxies slowly drift apart as they cool and grow dark. In the Big Rip, an accelerating universe propelled by dark energy tears itself to shreds. Astronomers now think the Big Chill is the most likely, based on the latest measurements of the speed of the accelerating universe, but what will actually come to pass depends on those mysterious subjects dark matter, and dark energy. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. Many of you will remember the VCR and the Betamax video recorders, but the first commercial video recorder was made by the Californian company Ampex. It was known as the VR1000, and it was launched at an exhibition in Las Vegas in 1956. It was over twice the size of a wardrobe. It ran on tapes two inches wide and 875 yards long, and it was initially intended for use by television stations, but soon led to the development of the home video recorder. Telcam, the first video recorder for the domestic market also used reels of tape and was sold in Britain first in 1963 by the Nottingham Electronic Valve Company. Mr. Fleming, how does an author tackle the problem of selecting a name for the hero of his 
stories? Well, it isn't only the hero. I mean, I generally pick up names just driving through the countryside, I, through villages and so on. You'll see an interesting name uh, over a tobacconist or a chemist or something of that sort in any country in the world. But um, when I started to write these books in 1952, I wanted to find um, a name which wouldn't have any of this a romantic uh, overtones like Peregrine Carruthers or whatever it might be. I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now, that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. In 1845, Sir John Franklin set from England with two ships, Terra and Erebus, and 129 crewmen, in search of the Northwest Passage, a shipping route from the Atlantic to the Pacific through Canada. The expedition never returned. Search parties found few clues. Messages left at a rock carn on King William Island and a few Inuit witnesses told how the two ships became trapped in the ice of Victoria Strait. Franklin died of unknown causes the following year. The ships continued drifting through the next winter as more men perished. Finally, the new captain, Francis Crozier, apparently abandoned the ships and set out with the crew over the ice in a desperate attempt to reach land. A few bodies have been found. The wreck of Erebus was located, followed by the terror in 2016. The recovered bones of some of the men bore knife marks, suggesting the crew was fending off starvation by cannibalism. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. At his peak, Glenn Miller's illustrious musical journey took a pause. He made a remarkable sacrifice. He exchanged the life of commercial success for the solemnity and nobility of a military uniform. His mission was to uplift the spirits of the US troops deployed during the era of World War II. And on a fog-laden afternoon, on December the 15th, 1944, Miller embarked on his final journey, departing from England to France. Sadly, his aircraft vanished into the obscurity of the English Channel, and it shrouded Miller and his disappearance in a curious veil of uncertainty. His disappearance has become one of history's enduring enigmas. The passage of time has only deepened it. Do search online for the full story, and subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. If you watch most American movies from the 30s and 40s, you'll find that most have a cavity-inducing sweetness to them. It's because the films of the day were policed by a production code that we call the Hayes Code. Named after Will Hayes, Postmaster General, Hayes said that if films wanted to be considered a universal form of entertainment, they needed to proceed forward with good taste and community value. When men and women were depicted as a married couple in a bedroom together, they could have the couple sleeping in separate twin beds, or they could show the couple sleeping in the same bed, but the woman had to have one foot on the floor for the duration of the scene. Indecent dances, excessive body movements while the feet are stationary was forbidden. Excessive kissing, where the kiss lasted longer than three seconds, was banned. The studios were also forbidden to show interracial relationships. Join me at Curious Tales and Tours for more. Thought to be the cup used by Jesus at the Last Supper, the Holy Grail did not appear in literature until the 12th century, when the French poet Chrétien de Troyes wrote Percival, the story of the Grail. In this unfinished romance, the Grail is a serving dish, one of several mystical objects paraded before the young Percival. However, the Grail was not associated with the Last Supper until the next century, in Robert de Boron's poem, Joseph of Arimathea. From there, the legend of the Grail blossomed, along with Arthurian romances in a mix of Celtic and Christian symbolism. It was the object of literary quests, particularly that of the pure Sir Galahad. Some say the Knights Templar rescued it from Jerusalem and hid it all too successfully. Many locations, from Spain to Maryland, have claimed to possess the true grail. The grail is almost certainly an invention. Historians believe that if any cup used by Jesus did somehow survive, it would be unidentifiable today. Countless 19th, 20th and 21st century paintings, novels and films have featured the object in settings ranging from the Louvre to outer space. Robbie Williams and Jimmy Page live side by side. This is Tower House, built in the 1800s, and this is Jimmy Page's home. And quite famously in the newspapers a few years back, there was a land dispute between Jimmy Page and Robbie Williams. You almost couldn't make that up. 
Robbie Williams was having some restoration work done to his property and I think building maybe a cellar and Jimmy Page was worried and concerned that the foundations of his property would be compromised. Early theories included the idea that it formed at the same time as Earth from the debris of the early solar system, or that the Earth captured the moon as it floated past, but studies of moon rocks and the physics of such a capture make both ideas doubtful. The current thinking is this. Early in Earth's existence, about four and a half billion years ago, a giant object the size of Mars struck Earth with a glancing but titanic blow. Great chunks of Earth's crust and mantle were ejected into space, merging with parts of the impacting body in a molten disk that coalesced to form the moon. This theory is supported by the overall composition of the moon and the mathematics of the spin of both Earth and its satellite. Moon rocks returned by the Apollo scientists cast some doubt on this, seeming to be chemically identical only to Earth rocks, not Mars. Mars. Recently, chemists have found oxygen elements with a slightly heavier composition that increase deeper below the surface in the moon's mantle. The heavier oxygen might belong to the impactor, and the moon may have formed farther from the gravity of the sun than the Earth. But all prevailing theories say the moon formed following a collision between the Earth and a large body. Movie mysteries which will never be solved. Inception. Is Cobb awake or dreaming? The debate rages online to this very day. The biggest talking point about Christopher Nolan's epic inception is its unresolved ending. We see the dream thief Dom Cobb reunited with his children, while his totem, which is a top he uses to determine whether he is awake or not, continues to spin on. Before we witness whether the top continues to revolve indefinitely, which would indicate that our guy is actually dreaming, the screen cuts to black, leaving us guessing. Christopher Nolan himself has been unsurprisingly coy on the subject, saying that the truth is somewhat meaningless, because Cobb himself clearly no longer cares. There is evidence in the film. Everything from Cobb's absent wedding ring, which was typically a clue that he was awake, and, just before the blackout, the top wobbling slightly, that strongly support one conclusion. You probably know John Wayne, but did you know he once played Genghis Khan? In 1956, the Duke donned makeup to star as the famous Mongolian warrior. He needed one more film to wrap up his contract with RKO. He even pulled the script out of the trash and declared he played Khan like a cowboy. It was shot in the Utah desert, a site of nuclear bomb testing. Out of the 220 people involved in the film, 91 would later die of cancer. Even Wayne's son, who visited the set, succumbed to cancer years later. After the filming wrapped, the production company shipped 60 tons of radioactive dirt to Hollywood to finish scenes on sound stages. Where did that dirt end up? Nobody knows. Feeling guilty, reclusive producer Howard Hughes bought every print of the movie and kept them locked away, watching the film obsessively in his later years. There's even a photo of John Wayne on set, holding a Geiger counter, showing very high radiation levels. Join me for more curious tales and tours. The man who would become movie legend John Wayne started out as a prop boy and extra for the Fox Film Corporation, working his way up to bit parts before he would be cast in his first leading role, 1930's The Big Trail. The film's director, Raoul Walsh, wanted an unknown who could bring to life the rugged, unpolished quality of life in the Old West. As Walsh recalls, the expression on his face was so warm and wholesome that I stopped and watched. I noticed the fine physique of the boy, his careless strength, the grace of his movement. The problem was that this particular up-and-coming actor was actually named Marion Morrison, and having a macho western leany man named Marion Morrison simply wouldn't do. So Walsh and studio head Winfield Sheehan came up with the name John Wayne, partly because Sheehan admired American Revolutionary General Anthony Wayne, and partly because the name seemed suitably masculine. There's still disagreement about whether Sheehan or Walsh had the larger part in coming up with the name, but it's extremely clear Marion Morrison himself had no input and didn't much care either. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. We have pyrotechnics. It can it can get a little hot up there, yeah, I must say. But our mm. pyrotechnics guy, who in whom we trust, is called Shaky. And the thing I think I like most about it is that as as we know the explosion's about to happen, the big first explosion. So we often look at the people, particularly in the front row, who are like blithely going along like this and then boom, oh! And you just, it's great to just watch them. They look at each other and oh, oh my God, and they're shocked. We did it in early days and, we, and the, there was an explosion. And I, I suddenly noticed as we started it, it was like a 90 year old woman, very old, in, in the front row. 
I'm, I suddenly go, we're going to kill her. I can't stop the song, so you, you cover your ears, love. So it comes to it, and I kind of go, oh my God, I kind of look away, live on it. Boom! And I look back to her thinking, God, and she is loving it. In 1502, Florentine politician Piero Sodorini commissioned Leonardo da Vinci to paint a mural in Florence's Palazzo Vecchio. The final painting depicting the victory of Tuscan forces at the Battle of Anghiari was huge, possibly 20 feet long and 10 feet high. By all accounts, da Vinci was not happy with his finished work. Experimenting with oil paints on the wall of the Hall of the 500, he found that the colours ran and blurred. He abandoned the mural, unfinished. Apparently many were impressed by the dramatic battle scene, but when the hall was remodelled, artist Giorgio Vasari was hired to paint over da Vinci's work. Some now believe that Vasari built a false wall to protect it and painted his own mural on top. In 2012, art historian Maurizio Saracini inserted a tiny camera into a crack in the wall and detected a hollow space and black pigment behind Vasari's mural. The investigation is still on hold. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. For a film that succeeds mainly due to its dialogue, the biggest mystery in Lost in Translation surrounds a few lines at the end of the film that can't be heard. At the finale, fading, jaded film star Bob Harris, played by Bill Murray, says an emotional goodbye to college grad student Charlotte, played by Scarlett Johansson. He whispers the final few words in her ear. If you do a quick online search, you'll find many videos where editing software has been used to amplify Bob's voice, which supposedly reveals his message to Charlotte. But as the dialogue was unscripted and the original audio quality involved was terrible, we will never be 100% certain of the exact wording. Furthermore, director Sofia Coppola deliberately left this ad-lib dialogue inaudible to audiences. Even if we could be sure, this scene stands out as a further reminder that some things are best left to the imagination. In 1692, Betty Paris of Salem Village, Massachusetts, began complaining of strange pains and fevers and contortions of her body. Soon, six other girls exhibited the same symptoms. It all ended with 20 men and women blamed for this malady and hanged as witches. Over 300 years later, 20 teenagers in Leroy, New York, began to twitch, tick and contort in spasms. The doctors gave the incidents in Leroy and Salem the same diagnosis, neurological symptoms stemming from psychological conflict. In groups, it's known as mass psychogenic illness or mass hysteria. The word hysteria comes from the root word for womb which the Greeks believed wandered around the female body. Many episodes began with the report of a strange smell. Some come and go within a day, whereas others, like the Leroy incident, last for weeks. No single physical cause for mass hysteria has ever actually been pinpointed. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. If you put Dirty Harry and his wonderful directing career aside, Clint Eastwood is probably best known for his portrayal of the man with no name in three films directed by Sergio Leone. All three, A Fistful of Dollars, For a Few Dollars More, and The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, have beginnings, middles and ends, pretty much open and shut affairs. With one exception, we never learn the man with no name's real name. With Sergio long gone, and Eastwood as tight-lipped as he'll ever be, it seems unlikely we'll ever get an answer, which is probably as it should be, as discovering the man's given name would rob this mysterious, enigmatic figure of his mystique. One thing is certain, he has nicknames along the way, Joe, Manco, and Blondie. Is it possible that one of these names is his real one? Hardly. Join me at Curious Tales and Tours for more. Captain David Morehouse of the Brig de Gracia was about one month into an Atlantic crossing on December the 5th, 1872, when he came across a disturbing sight. Drifting in the choppy seas nearby was the brigantine Mary Celeste. Morehouse knew the ship and its captain, Benjamin Briggs. A boarding party confirmed that no one remained on board. There was no sign of violence, but one lifeboat was missing. Papers were tossed about and a pump was disassembled. The De Gracia brought the abandoned ship to Gibraltar and the guessing game began. They fell victim to drunken mutineers, or pirates, or the De Gracia itself looking for salvage money. The crew went mad after eating ergo fungus on tainted rye bread. A giant squid devoured them. The most current theories focus on either the volatile alcohol in the cargo hold or the broken pump as possible reasons for abandoning the ship. 
On a hot day four and a half thousand years ago, the Chinese emperor Chen Nong was boiling water to refresh himself. A few leaves blew off a nearby shrub and landed in the water, and he named the resultant brew Tei, or Cha. The legend is an appealing one, but in fact no one knows who first drank tea. But tea leaves do come from the evergreen shrub, Camellia sinensis, which is native to the foothills of the Himalayas. Until the mid-19th century, tea was so valuable, it was kept in lockable containers, or caddies. The word caddy is derived from kati, a Malaysian measure of weight. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. Every, every evening on weekdays, I used to phone my agent saying, have you got a job for me? One night I phoned, she said, I've got a job. She said, but you, my real name is Michael White. And I called myself Michael White. And she said, I've got a job, sir, but you've got to belong to equity. And you can't be called Michael White because there's already a, a, an actor called Michael White in equity. She said, you call yourself Michael. You can't call yourself White. And, and I need a name now. Think of a name. And I was in Leicester Square, which is like Broadway with all cinemas. And my favorite actor is Humphrey Bogart at that time. And I looked round. And it said, Humphrey Bogart in the Kane Mutiny. So I said, call me Kane, Michael Kane. She said, how do you spell it? I said, C-A-I-N-E. It was a good job. It wasn't the next theater because I'd have been called Michael 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> Do we really live in a multiverse? The theory of cosmic inflation, first proposed by Alan Guth in 1980, solves some problems of Big Bang cosmology by positing that space-time expanded at an extremely rapid rate in its early moments. Other theories say that although our universe stopped inflating, inflation elsewhere might continue, forming other universes like bubbles right next to our own bubble. String theory is an attempt to bridge the gaps between relativistic physics and quantum physics. According to string theory, the universe has many more dimensions than the four we know. Other universes could have formed in this multi-dimensional space totally invisible to us. The big problem is multiverse theories are unprovable. We can't observe them. There might be another you in another universe, but you'll never know. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. How did the ancient Egyptians build the Great Pyramid? It was raised as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu around 2560 BC. Egyptian architects, more than likely, employed tens of thousands of workers to transport its 2.3 million limestone blocks, each weighing an average of two and a half tons. Theories about the methods used to build the Great Pyramid range from cranes to aliens. Most scenarios involve a ramp of some sort. However, a straight ramp would have to have been at least a mile long to reach the pyramid's top without being too steep, and there is no evidence for this kind of structure. A winding ramp around the outside would not have allowed engineers to measure the corners, which would have been necessary if they were to meet neatly at the top. But in 2017, researchers found a tantalizing clue. Cosmic ray scanning, known as muon radiography, detected a void in the structure at least 100 feet long. Was there an internal ramp used to drag stones into place? We're not sure. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. What are the Nazca Lines? Over 2,000 years ago, people etched more than a thousand outsized figures in the coastal desert of southwestern Peru, suggesting the shapes of giant creatures concentrated between the towns of Nazca and Palpa. In the 1920s, pilots rediscovered the enormous geoglyphs, prompting decades of research to answer the question, what are they for? Students of the figures have theorized that they represent irrigation lines, an astronomical calendar, Inca roads, icons, to be viewed from archaic hot air balloons, spaceports for alien aircraft. Today's most popular explanation is simpler, ceremonial pathways in a holy landscape. Many of the figures are associated with rain or fertility, and braces of footprints can still be seen along the lines. The proponents of the ancient astronaut theory claim that the lines can only be seen from the sky, but in fact the figures are clearly visible from nearby hills. As they moved into Europe and Eurasia about 60,000 years ago, modern humans encountered another human species, Neanderthals. Descended from humans who left Africa in an earlier migration, Neanderthals were a hardy people whose stocky, muscular bodies helped them survive their harsh environment. They walked upright, had larger brains than modern humans, produced tools, and buried their dead with rituals. At one time, Neanderthals were widespread across Europe and into Eurasia, but by about 40,000 years ago, they were extinct. They may have been unable to adapt to the changing, colder climate. They were outcompeted by modern humans. They simply dwindled due to death rates, or possibly they were absorbed into the modern human bloodline by interbreeding. In 2009, Swedish biologist Svante Parbo completed the first draft of an analysis of the Neanderthal genome. 
they found that modern Europeans and Asians share 2.5% of their genome with Neanderthals. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. The first instant coffee was the invention of the Japanese-American chemist Satori Kato in 1901. Two years later, Ludwig Roselius, a German importer, first made decaffeinated coffee, calling it Sanka, from the French sans, without, and caffeine, ka. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. What will we find in the buried city of Petra? Travellers seeking the eastern entrance of Petra, the ancient city in Jordan's southwestern corner, have to wend their way through one of the most dramatic approaches in the world, a 250-foot-high slot canyon known as the Seek. At the canyon's end are immense pillars of the treasury, actually a temple, carved into the sandstone cliff, and inside, a small tomb. It was once a prosperous city. Petra is now mainly hidden under sand and debris. It was founded by the Nabataeans, Arab nomads who settled in the area and made it into a center of trade for perhaps a thousand years. Their clever water systems allowed for public baths and very lush gardens in the desert. Romans moved in around the second century, after which the city began to decline and the original dwellers were forgotten. In 2016, satellite surveys revealed the most impressive structure yet, a monumental platform hiding in plain sight. Did Ponce de Leon find the Fountain of Youth? It's been the object of many a hopeful quest. The ancient Greeks, medieval Arabs and others feature a restorative fountain or river in their romantic tales. But perhaps the best known is the one that Spanish explorer Juan Ponce de Leon is said to have been searching for in Florida. He was the colonial governor of Puerto Rico from 1509 to 1511. And they say now he was looking for gold, land and native peoples to enslave when he set out to find an island known as Bimini in 1513. But instead he reached the coast of Florida, visiting the new land twice twice over the next few years, before being fatally wounded by a native's arrow. And it was only in later accounts did chroniclers, possibly mocking him, claim that he was looking for this legendary fountain of youth. Ponce de Leon's lack of success has not stopped the Florida city of St. Augustine from establishing a fountain of youth archaeological park near a natural hot spring. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. Director Quentin Tarantino said he never actually had anything in mind, he just intended, whatever was in the case, to be something driving the plot forward. But I suppose what matters is that the briefcase stores something precious enough to provide motivation for the characters. Initially, the case was to contain diamonds. Later, this was deemed too generic. It was replaced by an unseen glowing item, leaving audience members to imagine something that the other characters prize highly. Of course, this hasn't stopped fans from coming up with unbelievably fanciful theories regarding what the briefcase actually contains. One of the most popular tropes identifies the luminous substance as gangster Marcellus Wallace's soul, which, while all these theories are technically not correct, they are valid nonetheless. In his short career, silent star Rudolf Valentino attracted a degree of passionate devotion that it is now difficult for modern folks to wrap our minds around. In 1921, he starred in two films, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and The Sheik. They were both huge hits and cemented his reputation as an exotic, romantic lead. Possibly jealous of Valentino's magnetism, male writers insinuated in magazines that he was gay. Valentino attempted to put these rumours to rest with a robustly athletic performance in 1926's The Sun of the Sheik. As he left the New York premiere, he was completely swarmed by fans, but two weeks later he collapsed from a ruptured appendix. He underwent surgery but took a turn for the worse, falling into the coma and passing away. Over a hundred thousand people gathered on the streets outside the place where Valentino's body was being prepared. The silent star's premature passing deprived history of learning whether he would have been successful in navigating the transition from silent films to talkies. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. The Curious Tale of the Sewing Machine In 1846, a Boston mechanic, Elias Howe, developed a machine after watching his wife's arm movements while sewing. He was unable to find backing and three years later travelled to England. He sold the British rights for £250 to a corset manufacturer but returned home destitute to find his patent infringed by the new manufacturers. One of these included Isaac Singer, who produced the first truly practical sewing machine in 1851. Howe successfully sued Singer, but the manufacturers 
subsequently decided to share their ideas in one of the world's first patent pools. It was Singer who forged ahead, introducing the home sewing machine in 1856. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. Stanley Kubrick's spine-tingling masterpiece The Shining sets the standard when it comes to ambiguity as it slowly shows Torrance's descent into madness. It contains numerous unexplained happenings, but it's the final scene, indeed the final shot of the film, where a photograph taken in the Overlook Hotel during the 1920s is shown, which is the really curious one. Jack himself is standing front and centre. One theory suggests that the haunted house has absorbed Jack after he died mid-homicidal spree. Another one suggests the modern-day Jack is a reincarnation of a previous occupant from all those years ago. Well, with this one, we'll never know what Kubrick was getting at. He preferred to leave the guesswork directly to the audiences, and if you go to the source material, the photograph doesn't feature. Join me at Curious Tales and Tours for more. Why do rocks slide across Death Valley? The moving rocks of racetrack player, a flat, dry lake bed in Death Valley National Park, have intrigued visitors for years. Rocks weighing up to 700 pounds have been found at the end of long tracks, scraped out of the player's desiccated surface. Some of these paths are up to 3,000 feet long. The rocks are not sliding downhill. In fact, most travel very slightly uphill, and wind by itself can't move heavy boulders these distances. In 2014, researchers observed the phenomenon. And what was the mystery? Just the right conditions of temperature, sun, and wind. When rare, windowpane thin ice freezes over a layer of water shallow enough to leave the rocks exposed, and the morning sun melts the ice into panels, the wind can push those ice panes against the rocks, leaving a trail on the floor of the player. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. Was the Count of Saint Germain immortal? He was accomplished, influential, and according to some, immortal. He appeared in European courts in the mid-1700s. Horace Walpole wrote of this odd man, been here these two years, and will not tell us who he is, or from where. He sings, composes, is mad, and not very sensible. He calls himself an Italian, a Spaniard, a Pole. Someone said he married a great fortune in Mexico, ran away with the jewels to Constantinople, and some say he was a priest, a fiddler, and a vast nobleman. Saint Germain was actually, in fact, a diplomat, and also, by his own account, hundreds of years old. According to Casanova, this extraordinary man would say in an easy, assured manner that he was at least 300 years old, that he knew the secret of universal medicine, and that he could melt diamonds. Who he really was is still unknown. He died in Germany in 1784 at the age of 188, 223, or over 2000, depending on the source. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. It was a druid's place of worship and human sacrifice. It was a temple for healing, assembled by giants. It was a vast solar observatory, the capital of Bronze Age British culture, a monument to multiple gods, or a sacred site of the ancestral dead. All these meanings and more have been assigned to Stonehenge, this famous circle of stones on England's Salisbury Plain. Many of these theories have been disproved, but the monument's actual purpose is still a mystery. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. We do know that Stonehenge is far older than the Druids. It was built in stages between about 3000 and 1520 BC. In 2021, archaeologists uncovered the remains of what appear to be the original Stonehenge stones. Up to 80 bluestone blocks, weighing several tons each, were somehow transported from Wales, a distance of 160 miles. An outer circle of sandstone sarsens, some weighing up to 50 tons, was quarried 20 to 30 miles away on the Marlborough Downs and set in place around 2500 BC. The circle seems to be aligned to the midsummer and midwinter solstices, but seems otherwise not to have an astronomical function. It's possible that the site was intended for ancestor worship, though evidence is still scarce. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. There are still undiscovered animals, even in the centre of London. Southeast London, not too far from a place called Sydenham, there have been sightings of beasts, or a beast, which has now been named the Beast of Sydenham. It was first encountered by a resident named Tony Holder, and it was in March 2005. He was out looking for his cat, and he said that he came under attack. He said a five-foot-long animal pounced on him, and he said it was like a panther or a large cat, and it pinned him to the ground. It ran off before doing any serious damage. 
but Mr Holder was treated for scratches by ambulance crew. The police team came along and they were armed with tranquilizer guns. They just looked through the area in search of the beast without success. Large black cats do exist in the country, but to see one five foot long in a suburban area, Sydenham, been seen a few times. The last sighting apparently was in 2009 when a jogger was chased by the animal. It's possible that the most amazing archaeological site in history is Tanis. Fans of Raiders of the Lost Ark might recognise it as the buried city that supposedly held the Ark of the Covenant. Today it's known as Son El Haga, but the real historical city of Tanis was lost to the world for roughly 2,000 years. It was located on the Nile Delta, and it vanished beneath the sands when the river shifted its course. Eventually, no one knew where to find it, or just what lay within. European investigators began began to uncover portions of the city by the late 19th century, but the most awe-inspiring finds came in 1939, when French archaeologist Pierre Monte uncovered a royal tomb complex which housed golden masks, jewellery, silver coffins, and treasures rivaling those of Tutankhamun. Some of the treasures of Tanis can now be found in Cairo's Egyptian Museum. Infrared satellite imagery has revealed more buildings waiting to be uncovered. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and I leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and I pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for so many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. Bromley is a thriving market town on the southeast London and Kent borders. Notable people to have been born or resided in the area include Emma Raducanu, David Bowie, Gary Rhodes, Alistair Crowley and H.G. Wells, who was born on this site in 1866. Some years back a mural was painted on a Bromley wall celebrating this great writer. And then a Kent archaeologist finds a letter after he had been offered the freedom of the town of Bromley. It reads as follows. Bromley has not been particularly gracious to me, nor I to Bromley. I don't think I want to add the freedom of Bromley to the freedom of the city of London and the freedom of the city of Brussels, both of which I have. So the mural has been changed and celebrates Charles Darwin, one who definitely did not upset the local residents. Join me for more quirky tales of London. Subscribe to my channel below and I'll see you very soon. Hollywood's relationship to the Third Reich before Pearl Harbor was a complex one. Film producers, particularly Jewish ones, had ample reason to dislike Nazis, but the US was not yet at war with them, and it wasn't necessarily good for business to lampoon the government of a large foreign market. Hollywood tended to tread carefully. Charles Chaplin lampooned the Third Reich leader in The Great Dictator, which was released in October 1940. But curiously, the Three Stooges got the jump on Chaplin by nine months, releasing their own quickie, You Nasty Spy, in the January of that year. They play dim-witted wallpaper hangers who were installed as dictators of the country of Moronica. The businessmen who elevate them think they are stupid enough to be easily controlled. Mo plays the Hitler-like leader, Curly plays Field Marshal Gallstone, and Larry is Propaganda Minister Pebble, culminating in the dictatorial trio getting deposed and eaten by lions. In 1941, a sequel came out called I'll Never Hile Again. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. Most time travel scenarios derive from the more extreme implication of Einstein's theories of relativity. Time is not separate or absolute. As part of the space-time continuum, it slows for very massive or very fast objects. A 20-year-old woman boarding a spaceship that travels for five years at close to the speed of light could return to an Earth on which 50 years have passed. She has effectively travelled 45 years into the future. The same effect would apply if she visited an extremely massive object, such as a neutron star. Wormholes are another theory. Certain kinds of black holes might just form a tunnel through space and time. If they do exist, wormholes would require an exotic species of anti-gravitating matter to stay open, and almost certainly would destroy anything travelling through. These radical methods require vast amounts of energy, far more than we can currently harness, and work only for travel into the future. Then there's the very real grandfather paradox. If you go back in time and kill your own grandfather, what then? 
Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. It's Oscar time again, but have you ever wondered how many films that we know and love have never won a single Oscar award? Here's a list. 1940, The Great Dictator. 1946, It's a Wonderful Life, directed by Frank Capra and starring James Stewart. 1954, Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. 1957, Twelve Angry Men, starring Henry Fonda and Jack Klugman. 1960, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. 1971, A Clockwork Orange. 1976, Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. 1982, Blade Runner, directed by Ridley Scott and starring Harrison Ford. 1989, Kevin Costner stars in Field of Dreams. And perhaps the greatest of them all, the number one ranked film on IMDb, 1994's The Shawshank Redemption. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. The shroud itself is a long, rectangular, flaxen cloth that many believe to be Jesus' burial wrappings. The shroud is currently held in Turin's Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. The validity of the shroud has been debated since it first came to view in the 14th century. In 1988, three independent carbon-dating tests put its origins between AD 1260 and AD 1390, long after Jesus' death. But curiously, in 2005, a scientist asserted that the tests were performed on patched areas, and that the shroud was, in fact, much older. This claim, in turn, was disputed in 2013. Scientists from the University of Padua retested the fibres from 1988, and dated them to be between 300 BC and AD 400, the time of Christ. In 2015, Pope Francis made a pilgrimage to see the shroud. A replica is on display in Turin's Museum of the Shroud. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. The 240-page vellum work is written in an unknown language and contains hundreds of illustrations of astrological symbols, unidentifiable plants, and bizarre human figures. Legions of cryptographers have tried and failed to decipher the manuscript's lettering. The manuscript is named after the Polish-American bookseller, Wilfred Voynich, who bought it in 1912, but its provenance is much older. It dates back to at least the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II of Germany, around 1612, who acquired it leaving it to be the work of medieval scholar Roger Bacon. The seller may have been the notorious English astrologer and student of the occult, John Dee, who had a collection of Bacon's works. The manuscript then passed through various other European owners, none of whom could make sense of it. Claims of decipherment continue. Recent tests confirm that it dates to the early 15th century, but today the Voynich manuscript resides in Yale's Beinick Library. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. Was Walt Disney cryogenically frozen? Walt Disney, an innovator and technology enthusiast, inspired projects like Epcot, the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Despite his fearless career, he was said to be terrified of death and avoided others' funerals his entire life. This led to speculation about his interest in cryonics, the process of freezing people after death. Rumours emerged after his death in 1966, suggesting he was cryogenically frozen and buried specifically underneath Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean ride. However, this is false. Bob Nelson, former president of the Cryonics Society of California, confirmed Walt missed out on cryonics as he actually never specified it in writing. Walt's daughter and legal documents affirm he was cremated and interred at Forest Lawn Memorial Park. But despite this, the myth persists, and some believe that Disney Studios actually named their two 2013 movie Frozen to divert future online searches. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. I certainly loved Jimmy. I certainly was one of the first people to see him in London, and it was mind-blowing, you know. I was in a club late at night called The Bag of Nails, actually, where I met Linda. you just go in there, and it was empty, and I just heard this sort of clunking, clicking, a little stage in the corner, and I heard a sort of <coughs> of, like, 
a loud jack plug being plugged in, but a big amp. And then it was Jimmy and uh, Noel and Mitch in the corner. No one had heard them. And he did his whole act for virtually no one in the club. He's doing all that stuff. And I'm just, oh, the, the first minute, the first second, he starts singing and playing. Kind of me with a couple of friends, late night, hardly anyone in the club. I think that was a Friday night. And on the Tuesday night, the word had got out. And now the club was steaming and packed for this new god in town. Plato was the first to tell its story in his two dialogues, Timaeus and Critias. According to Plato, Atlantis was a huge island beyond the Pillars of Hercules, i.e. the Strait of Gibraltar. The inhabitants at first lived an ideal existence. In time, however, they became ambitious and warlike. Angry Zeus destroyed the island with earthquakes and floods, and Atlantis sank beneath the waves. Most readers understood the story to be a parable of governance and corruption, but by the Middle Ages it began to be accepted as historical truth. True believers have since placed Atlantis in places as far afield as Spain, Malta, Ireland, and the unbelievably dry Sahara. More scholarly speculation about Atlantis focuses on finding Plato's actual inspiration for the island. The ancient Mediterranean has known its fair share of earthquakes. Amongst many natural events was the destruction of the city of Helica, overcome by earthquakes and floods in 373 BC, about 20 years before his story was written. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. Was there once a female pope? This idea took hold in the 13th century and soon became accepted as fact. According to some medieval chroniclers, when Pope Leo IV died in 855, he was succeeded by a brilliant Englishman, John of Mainz. John had occupied the seat for something like two years, when during a procession in Rome, he was overcome with pains, and in some versions of the story, Pope Joan took over, and then gave birth during a procession and was dragged out of Rome and stoned to death. For several centuries, the public believed in the historical truth of the female pope. Her bust stood amongst others in the Siena Cathedral. Renaissance historians included her in their accounts. Papal processions avoided the route on which Joan supposedly gave birth. Over time, however, scholars have noted that Pope Leo IV was succeeded in 855 by Benedict III. No contemporary account mentions a female pope. It is highly unlikely that she ever existed, but the legend has persisted. Plays, novels, and movies continue to feature Pope Joan all the way to the 21st century. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. What triggers an earthquake? In 2011, off the east coast of Honshu, Japan, a nightmare came to life. The magnitude 9 quake killed some 19,000 people and destroyed more than 300,000 buildings. No one could have predicted this. Science knows the basic mechanism of earthquakes. Earthquakes not related to a volcanic eruption appear because two blocks of earth sliding along a fault line build up energy from friction and then suddenly release it when a block overcomes the friction and jolts forward. The energy then moves in waves throughout the ground, shaking the surface. Many mysteries remain. Why all of a sudden does the friction suddenly ease? Does the rock become molten along the fault or powdery like talc? Pressure from water in reservoirs, or wastewater injected into the ground during natural gas drilling does trigger quakes. Along with dam building and mining activities, a new map show how far and wide man-made earthquakes reach. But science is sadly still at a loss to predict the next natural disaster. Subscribe for more curious tales and tours. How do trees get so old? A yew tree in a graveyard in Wales saw the Bronze Age in Britain. A bristlecone pine in California's Inyo Forest is nearly 5,000 years old. The Pando Aspen Colony in Utah makes them all look like single saplings, but they are considered a single living organism because genetically they identically stem from a single root system. While some say Pando is 80,000 years old, some estimates have said nearly 1 million. How do trees defy the aging process? Their genes don't seem to mutate or become damaged over time. Their vascular systems allow some of the tree to survive if another part dies. They can replace, therefore, their damaged organs. And some can even form clones. Why can't researchers be definite about the colony's age? It lacks tree rings. So observers make estimates based on what they know of previous aspen growth rates. Other, older aspen colonies may yet be found in the western United States. Science is also learning to regenerate ancient plants. In 2012, a Russian team reported it had grown a delicate Siberian flower from a seed which was 32,000 years old. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. Why do we sleep? From an evolutionary perspective, sleep seems both wasteful and dangerous. Sleeping animals don't reproduce, and they could be vulnerable to predators. Yet sleep also seems to be essential. Humans do it for roughly eight hours a day, as do all birds and mammals. People with a rare inherited form of insomnia typically die within a few years. Rats kept from sleep also die within weeks, 
though their autopsies reveal no physical cause. Many theories have been advanced, but none have been proven. Some scientists believe it must bolster brain functioning. Experiments have shown that during sleep the brain may consolidate recently learned information while weeding out other underused connections. Other researchers think sleep also serves the body by conserving energy and resources, while allowing for rapid arousal if danger threatens. But Stanford University's William Demont, the United States' preeminent sleep scientist, puts it this way, the only reason we need to sleep is because we get sleepy. Subscribe to Curious Tales and Tours for more. His father once sent him to a police station at the age of about four or five with a note. Now, for some reason, Alfred maybe had been naughty. The chief of police read the note, put him straight in the cell and locked the door for 10 minutes. When he let him out, he said, this is what we do to naughty boys. This might explain the guilt, the fear of the police. Hitchcock himself never worked out why he was there, but he always had a, a sort of distrust of the police in a 